Church of Ashland, Ohio. We're so grateful that you've come out on this glorious day of resurrection. Thank you for tuning in also. Hear these words from 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. His wounds are our healings. His death is our salvation. His resurrection is the new life for us, those of us who are healed. Our Lenten journey is now ended, but it's not quite complete. Hopefully, we are being renewed to live to righteousness. This Easter is a day of rejoicing and of renewal. May it be a day of new beginning as we are healed and make it our goal to die to sin and to live for righteousness. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia, believe it, live it, each and every day. May we pray. Help us all each day, living Lord, to be your Easter follower. May we die to sin, and may we live to righteousness. In your great and holy name, amen. Would you join me in our call to worship? We come seeking Jesus in the familiar story of faith. We gather to sing and pray the story we know in our hearts. And it's a story of love, triumph, and powerful grace. It's a story that witnesses to new life, now alive in us. And we rejoice and thank you, O God, for the life of your Son, resurrected by your love and your vibrant spirit. May your spirit fill our lives. The truth of the resurrection of the rest of our lives. Christ the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. We now can relight the Christ King.
The Old Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm chapter 118, verses 1 through 2, 17 through 24. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. I will not die, but live, and I will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you have answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. I have uh, one prayer request. Um, if you would please, uh, Mona has asked me to lift Dale up in prayer. He is having gallbladder surgery on Wednesday, and Carrie is having a colonoscopy on Friday. So we ask that everybody lift both of uh, Dale and Carrie. Please join me this morning in prayer. As the world sings triumph in Christ to heaven over death that you conquered, help us, Lord, remember tomorrow as well. When the Easter dresses are put away and the candy is all eaten, and on with life we go. Let us not forget this Easter day. The celebration of your resurrection over death is a celebration of life that should continue well beyond the Sunday service, and the music. It is beyond the sign of the spring, beyond the lily, beyond the new lambs grazing in open fields. Jesus, you are always with us and you always guide us. Who we are becoming is no secret to you. You who formed us in your mother's womb, you came down to earth to save us, love us, and show us how to live. May we chase after you for all of our days. Celebration of life and death. We trust that justice belongs in your hand, but we also trust that you have a great plan for us to see hearts transformed and lives changed. Jesus, thank you for your mercy that was displayed upon that cross and has given those who call upon your name and trust in you forgiveness for a new life. We want to be a part of your great redemptive plan on earth. Help us fix our eyes on Christ when we are tempted to look at the problems around us. We are asking that you give us the boldest proclaim, only solution to what our world is experiencing, and that's your glorious gospel. Thank you for communicating for us your love in a way that is so personal, so extravagant, so gracious. Thank you for dying and then rising from the dead so that we can have hope. Thank you for proving that you are real, you are powerful, and that only you give us the power of our lives, well, through your incarnation, death, and resurrection. Thank you for washing away our sins by offering yourself as a perfect and blameless sacrifice in our place. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us. We offer our lives as a living sacrifice for your gratitude, for your amazing grace. And we ask all these things this morning as we sing that prayer you taught us. <clears throat>
uh, seven weeks ago was when we started with Jesus and the disciples at the table for the last meal. But now that continues, we're about to go to that table again. There will be, when the elements are brought around, there will be two cups, one stacked inside the other, there will be the juice and the, the bread. So take a cup and just hold it and then we will all take them together. But I'd like to offer this prayer if I may. Even as Jesus called his disciples one by one, and he called them by name, so the risen Christ now calls each of us one by one, and name by name. He calls us to come and to share at this table a community of love. So come and join, not because of your good, but because Christ wants you. Eat and drink with Christ within this fellowship of those who are loved without any reservation at all. We all come to this table just as we are. Amen. Our communion hymn is Because He Lives. <clears throat>
For I received from the Lord what I also now hand on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took a simple loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks to his Father in heaven, he broke it. And he passed it amongst his closest. And he said, take each of you and eat this. Do this in remembrance of me. And then, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper. And he says, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
For as often as you eat of this bread and that you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until that glorious moment when he again returns. Amen.
just so you know, we're going to break the scripture up into four segments again. But before the scripture is read, we're all going to sing a verse of a hymn that matches the scripture. And then once the scripture is read, and then I will talk a little bit about that. So just so you know what's going on. So our first song that we will sing together is verse 4 of Go to Dark Gethsemane. day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Can you imagine, Mary? Friday, she watched them Crucify Jesus. Friday, they watched, she watched as he died. And then Friday, she watched as they placed him in a tomb. Then the sun goes down and it's the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, you're restricted in your movements. You're to go and worship God at the temple. Can you imagine that Saturday for Mary? She has to still be in shock feeling helpless, despondent. Could she even sleep? Could she even eat anything? But possibly by the end of the day, she and a couple of others decided that maybe, just maybe the following day, the first day of the week, maybe we should anoint the body. Maybe we should do it properly, with great respect. Of course, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus um, had spices and myrrh with the body, but they thought it might be more proper to do it and cleanse the body. So early on that first day, and as John tells us, it's in darkness, Mary returns to the tomb. We need to understand the word darkness here. For one, it's a physical darkness. It's dark. But there's also, darkness is a place of grief. It's a place of sadness, it's a place of anger, it's a place of fear. You see, just one week earlier, everything was happiness, joyful. There were miracles going on, there was a victory. But now it's darkness. Where, she wonders, are all the promises of Jesus? Where is the last will be first? Where is the meek shall inherit the earth? How could everything so quickly go so wrong? You feel the feeling that she had to have had. You see, her body, as well as her soul, are immersed in darkness. But also in this darkness, she sees the stone has been rolled away. Fear, I'm sure, has overwhelmed her because of that. And she has to think, after his betrayal, after his arrest, after his beatings, the trial, the scourging, the crucifixion, and then the burial, what more is going to happen? 
This is unbelievable. Someone has taken his body. This has to be the final humiliation, the final betrayal of her Lord, her rabbi, her friend. Now she's convinced, even without looking into the tomb, though, that Jesus' body is gone. So she turns and she runs back to the city to tell John, Peter, and the others the bad and the very bitter news. to believe 
And if we only read an English version Bible, we may never pick up on this. There's a lesson within three verses, and it's hidden unless we know the Greek words. You see, John writes in Greek, and in Greek, each word means something specific. Like in our language, we use the word love, and we smear that word over anything and everything from loving bagels to <laughs> loving watching birds fly. But in Greek, they have a specific word for every emotion. We're going to look at uh, verses 5, 6, and 8. It's the Greek word, saw. And if we read all three, we would just say that John saw, Peter saw, they both saw. So let's look at these. Verse 5, it says, John saw scripts. The saw in the Greek word here means it's a physical thing. He used his eye and he saw something. That's all that means. So John saw scripts. Verse 6, though, in English it says, Peter saw strips. Now, wouldn't we assume they both saw strips the way we would, you know? But the Greek word there is that Peter not only sees it, he starts to contemplate about it, to digest what he has seen. And then verse 8 says, he saw and believed. You see, John is writing this after the fact. The Greek word here means a spiritual insight. Not he just saw those. So you see what John's doing. He uses three Greek words in his retelling of the story to reveal to us the workings of our own personal spiritual journeys to God through Christ. You first see, you either reject or think about it, but then after you see it, you start contemplating about it, digesting the facts, if you will, and when you come to the right conclusion, you, that brings you to belief and understanding. Isn't that how we all came to God? And there it is, in black and white, that John wrote out for us. But then, that last bit that Matt read was, John brings us back to the story at hand. And he lets us know that the two of them return to their homes and lock the door. outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, 
Tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out, Teacher! Well, the disciples returned home with doubts and confusion. Mary returns to the tomb, and she's still in mourning. She's crying. And I think we've all felt that exhausted feeling when you just are so run out with emotions, you just can't go on any farther. It's hopeless. She drops to her knees and she looks into the tomb, finally. You see, where she drops to her knees is holy ground. But when she looks inside, she's shocked. What does she see? There's two angels, bright as lightning, setting right where the body had been laid. They're sitting on that ledge, and they ask, why are you weeping? Can you imagine Mary? What do you expect? What do you want me to say? She's incredulous at what this statement is that these people say to her. She says, where's his body? Bring him. Show me where. She's so distraught that she misses the fact that she's actually speaking to two angels. You know, all through the Bible, when an angel shows up, what do they usually say? Fear not, because they are so magnificent in their, in the sight. Now Mary hears somebody coming up behind her. So what does she do? She pulls back away from the opening, and she turns around on her knees. And there is a person standing there. And this person asks the same question. Why are you weeping? <laughs> Who are you looking for? There's very little light that's going on in the garden at this moment. And with tear-filled eyes, she asks, Tell me, sir, where you have taken the body so that I may go and retrieve it. But I love what happens at this moment. There's only one word spoken. One single word. It's one word that Mary was certain she would never, ever hear her Lord say again. She heard her teacher, her healer, her Lord say to her, Mary. And at that moment, the darkness lifts and the light of truth explodes in the garden. Seen the Lord, and she told them 
that he had said these things to her. Have you ever wondered why Jesus wouldn't allow Mary to wrap her arms around his legs? When she, I mean, obviously, any of us would reach out this way and want to say, you're here. And he says, no, don't hold on. Possibly, it's to help Mary to now understand the importance of the resurrection. Because from now on, Jesus' physical presence is not going to be there. And it won't be as important as it used to be. You see, from now on, it's going to be his spiritual presence that will be most important to them and to us. So in the form of the Holy Spirit, we are now to live by not his physical presence, but by faith, by hope, and by belief. That's the message. Now, the resurrection story is told in all four Gospels. Each one is just a shade different than the next because each one is looking at it from their own eyes of what's happened. But one of the things that is, a, is absolutely common between all four is the stone. In all four versions, the stone has already been rolled away. I don't know if you ever noticed that or not. So how has the, the stone been rolled away? Was it by an earthquake? Robbers, soldiers, skeptics, maybe even Jesus' own followers? No. God rolled the stone away. And we have to understand this too, that the rock, the stone, was removed not to let Jesus out, but to let us in to him, to face and face with Jesus and this resurrection miracle. That's why the rock is missing the women all ask who are going to move the stone, but I think the more important question here to ask us each today is who is going to move the stone in our own lives. You know, every one of us during our lives find ourselves separated from God for some one reason or the next. We find ourselves on the wrong side of the stone that barricades and blocks us from God. Well, what stones, you say? I don't have any stones. Yes. Possibly it's a stone of some bitterness that might have crept up into your lives. Maybe a situation in life that has hurt you. Maybe it's the stone of uncertainty, the stone of pride, the stone of fear, the stone of hatred. And what happens? You find yourself like Mary was. Weary, worn out, exhausted. Who can take the weight off? Who can roll the stone away? What we must really understand at this moment is that the stone is already rolled away. Jesus did it on the cross, and he arose on the third day. There is no stone in any of our lives if we believe. <clears throat> the ultimate reality of Easter is that the stone has been, that's blocked mankind for generations has been destroyed on the day of resurrection. And the truth is, Jesus is alive. His victory over death has removed all barriers between you and everlasting life. So if you believe, there's only one thing left for you to do. You're supposed to live life with joy, live life with confidence, and as Jesus said to Mary, we are all to go and tell others. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. Our closing hymn is Up From the Grave, He Arose. If you were able to stand, please stand.
not look for the risen Christ only here in the confines of this church building, but seek the risen Christ on the roads and on the streets and all of the pathways and byways of our lives. Do not seek comfort in the familiar, but dare to risk the unfamiliar, and that his resurrection makes all things new. Because Christ lives, go go with, there are now new possibilities, and they're always before us. Christ is risen indeed. Go.